Okay. Hi, everyone. This is Regina Gale, and I'm the executive director of the Gold Coast Arts Center and the Gold Coast International Film Festival. And at this time, we are looking for alternate ways to bring you the best of film and experiences in the arts. Uh, so today, uh, I'm happy to introduce you to a filmmaker who many of you may already have met when we screened his previous film, uh, Sidemen, at our festival, our film festival a couple of years ago. So ladies and gentlemen, I want you to meet the, the filmmaker, the man who just completed Life and Larry Brown, a film we will have uh, pre premiered, I'm happy to say. And uh, everyone, please meet Scott Rosenbaum. Hello, Scott. Hey, good morning. Thanks so much for, uh, for doing this. I really appreciate everything that uh, the team at Gold Coast is, is doing to help uh, get films out in this difficult time and uh, give us this opportunity. So thank you very much. It's our pleasure. It's what we do and, and happy to do. And we've had such a positive relationship with you when, you, when we screened your, your last film. A lot of you. Yep. Um, maybe you want to fill everybody in on, on what happened subsequently. Uh, in terms of Sidemen? Or, yeah, Sidemen, uh, which, which festival is that, two years ago? Sure, it was, uh, actually, I can look at my award, it was 2016, actually, believe it or not, at this point. Oh my God. Or, I can't believe how much time has, has flied, but yeah, Sidemen, uh, it was uh, a great experience. We, we screened it at the 2016 festival and won the audience award, um, which was fantastic. Um, and. Uh, yeah, that was that was certainly the beginning of our relationship, and uh, I'm thrilled to again have this opportunity for my my latest documentary film that we're going to talk about today. Okay, well, uh, let let me ask you to give us the title of the documentary and a brief synopsis of uh, of what it's about. Sure. Well, Life and Larry Brown is the title of the film. Um, it's really a film that I never anticipated making, especially after. Um, the eight years that it took to complete Sidemen, which uh, obviously those have seen it know is a film about um, the Sidemen to the great Muddy Waters and Helen Wolf, all these elderly blues men who really laid the foundation for all the rock and roll that I grew up loving and appreciating. Um, that film was very much uh, an homage to those men behind the scenes and the contribution they made to all of popular music. So um, fast forward, I guess it's a couple of years after that release now. Uh, I was introduced to Larry Brown through a mutual friend and, and one of the producers of, of Larry Brown who happened upon him in the Guitar Center over here in uh, Garden City. Larry was uh, sitting in uh, the acoustic room and just picking away on a, an acoustic guitar and playing his harmonica. Uh, my friend, who's a big blues fan, recognized right away the authenticity of of the Delta Blues style and walked over and started talking to Larry. And Larry proceeded to tell him this incredible story of his life. He had just gotten out of prison a few months prior to that. And uh, my friend came over that night and, and told me this and I was taken aback on several levels, not the least of which as a filmmaker, I felt the immediate pull to have to tell this story. And uh, from there we, set out to do it. It was, again, like I said, not a, a story I was looking to tell after um, the Sidemen uh, experience, although it was a great experience. It was a lot of time and effort going into making a film about music, but Larry's story was one that was so compelling. I just uh, had no choice as a storyteller and a filmmaker other than to pursue it. Let, let me just ask you a question, because this will be something that um, our our people who attend our films uh, always want to ask of our short, especially the short filmmakers. Sure. Uh, everybody knows that a feature film is just exponentially more expensive to make. Mm -hmm. But we've had filmmakers tell us the budgets of what the short films will take. And I think people are quite surprised by how much it costs to make a short film. Sure. Uh, as far as the budget on this, um, very much in the same way uh, that Sidemen is incalculable. This was just a, a labor of love. So how do you put a price tag on the amount of time and contribution that the team of filmmakers put into this for free um, to, to tell the story? So uh, aside from just hard costs, um, uh, you know, rentals and food and everything that goes into um, just the process of the filmmaking over the course of the year, um, 
you know, the contributions of everybody involved, you know, hard to put a price tag on it. But to your point, that was one of the um, motivating factors in, in doing this was that we could do it in a short film format. It was local, um, unlike Sidemen, it traveled to every corner of the, the country and even some international locations. This was all central. So it was um, another factor that convinced me that it would be possible to, to do this without raising a, a whole lot of money. Okay, so then that's, uh, that answers that question. Um, you talked about what a frustrating process it can be. What are some of the frustrations you encounter? Uh, in generally in filmmaking or? You can be this? as general or specific as you like. Well, as finances is always a difficult prospect when you're telling um, a story, documentary in particular. Um, you need people who believe in the story and that that does that's no different than a, a narrative feature but uh raising finance is always tough um story-wise it was a challenging story for me to accept the um, responsibility to tell for many reasons uh, one of which uh is that the crime larry committed is is, is awful it's terrible um, ultimately the thing that mitigated my concerns with that as those that have seen the film or will see the film I think we'll agree his um, accountability for the crime, his clear remorse for the crime, and quite frankly, the lesson that I believe his story um, portrays is a real cautionary tale for anyone who can lose their temper in a moment and do something um, stupid and, and awful that impacts your own life for many years or forever and the lives of the victim and their families. Um, it was tough to reconcile, but in, in thinking it through a lot um, prior to committing to doing it, I felt that it's a story worth telling. Agreed. Um, you said that you had had lunch with Larry three times. <laughs> yes. What, before... what was the compelling, what was, what was the tipping point for you when you realized, no, this is it. I just have to get, go do this. What was it he was, said or did? It was really everything he said every time I spoke with him, and it kept getting more and more um, really unbelievable. But the, the, the life he led, the, the trials and tribulations he experienced, uh, I think you ha if you have any degree of empathy, you can't help but feel for the guy. And that was really the, the challenge here was, you know, here and on one hand, he committed this awful crime. On the other hand, you start to get to know somebody you start to fill in the blanks and understand the circumstances that led to that crime. And you can see the entire spectrum of his life from uh, the time he was born in, in the Deep South into the most horrific racist um, experiences, which he portrays pretty graphically in his, um, in his description through the crime and then his, his very long prison sentence, which took away more than half of his life. Um, the victim and what that family endured, all of it um, played a factor. Was he, and I'm assuming he was, but what, was he hard to um, convince to have you tell his story? Did he want his story told? Was he open to that? He was ambivalent, but at the same time, I, I think it was some sort of catharsis for him as well to be able to articulate his experience. So uh, over the course of those, those three meetings, you, you referenced the lunches I had with him that I was trying to see if there was a story there that was worth telling, which was plainly obvious early on, but also um, that would convince me that I could um, take this on. Um, Larry was very forthright, which again was one of the, the factors that convinced me to, to pursue this. He was, he, as you can see, I think you see him on screen, you judge for yourself. I think he's um, as sincere as can be in his remorse. And um, just hearing those stories over the course of those three interviews, ultimately I said, yeah, I'll, I'll take this on. Um, his remorse was, um, was in, in making this a cathartic, in, in developing this conversation with him. And if at first he wasn't, um, open to this or maybe was hesitating, what would have been the reason for that, do you think? 
you know, I, it's, it's an awful thing. I mean, uh, how many people would be willing to be so honest and, and you turn a camera on anybody under any circumstance, they become self-conscious. So, you know, add to that having to share some really awful experiences, um, you know, the torture that he portrays as a young child is something that still affects him. And, you know, part of why we shot the film the way we did, I wanted the, the camera up close and personal because he was so willing to share and, and was so courageous with that. You see the pain and the impact that it had on him as an individual. Um, you can judge for yourself how remorseful he is. And, and uh, that's ultimately the goal, I think, of any filmmaker is to, uh, at least as, as I see it, to raise more questions than you answer. And, and I think that um, his portrayal of the crimes and um, the portrayal of the hardships he endured throughout his life are uh, just raw for anyone to see and, and judge for themselves. You can talk a little bit about your cinematographer and the decision mm -hmm. you referred to just now about bringing the camera in tight on him and the decision about the lighting and and uh, and why because you did talk about um, part of it was you had no you didn't have the funds to travel and to do reenactments. You want to mm -hmm. just talk about that as a filmmaker because an audience will want to know what goes through your mind. Sure. Decisions. Well, for better or worse, in all of my films, it seems, I tend to just jump into it and then figure it out, figure the pieces out afterwards and, and to some degree. Um, having been making films for a while now, I have a great team around me. And one of those people is Brian McElward, who shot this film. And uh, in the conversations with Brian prior to that interview that makes up the, the real spine of this piece, we discussed what we wanted to see, what we wanted to convey, what were the important factors. And given the fact that Larry spent 34 plus years in prison um, and he was such a compelling speaker, we wanted to both feature him and also give a sense of what it might be to be in a cell or in solitary confinement. So we you know, looked at various references in that particular style that Brian um, delivered so beautifully of just a one light setup, black background, just featuring the man and his story um, was, was really one of the uh, initial sort of touchstones that we had as far as the aesthetic. And then to counter that, um, when we were looking for some other um, venues to have him tell his story and his experience, the, the contrast to that very claustrophobic a claustrophobic space was um, the, the wide open beach in the wintertime and just the, the bright, fresh air and birds flying and the ocean. Um, so that was all part of the aesthetic that Brian and I worked on and, and wanted to try to um, convey many things in a very short period of time. It, it occurs to me as you're talking about solitary confinement, that we are speaking this way rather than in person because uh, we're all not exactly in solitary confinement, but for those people out there who are freaking out because they're experiencing mm -hmm. at-home house arrest, so to speak, this still doesn't compare to what this man endured. No, it doesn't, but I actually had that thought as well. And, and part of what my motivation for uh, reaching out to Carolyn and, and your team in, in releasing the film now and in this way is for that very reason. Um, very much like, like Sidemen yeah. um, in, in working with those three artists who struggled for five, six, seven decades and the trials and tribulations I was experiencing trying to make this film and it took me eight years, which is a tremendous amount of time, but then you look and you compare to your subject and you say, well, I, I really don't have anything to complain about, but Likewise, with this story, it definitely crossed my mind that his story is one that is oddly, eerily relatable to everyone who's watching this now. Just to have any degree of our freedoms taken away as, as Americans is, is so far into us um, that, you know, perhaps that, um, that will come through as well. It'll resonate, I think you're right. I think this will resonate uh, more at this time than it might have resonated six months ago. Sure, 
Sure. Um, you called it a, a smaller canvas project. Sure. For non artists, well, you want to explain? Yeah, I mean, a, a big canvas project is one that, you know, uh, you have a literal big canvas to paint on. You, you can go to various locations uh, nationally or internationally, you have a, a bigger budget to um, have things blow up or whatever may be on a big budget film. But when you are limited um, to a, a smaller canvas and you have a very finite uh, option, set of options to convey that story, um, sometimes it forces you to be more creative and uh, oftentimes it does. And, and this was no exception. I, I certainly hope the people who are watching the film agree, but we um, tried to make the most of what we had in terms of limitations and time and uh, locations. But really at the end of the day, Larry, to me, um, carries the film because of his, who he is and how he um, comes across on camera and the way he tells his story. That was the most important thing to me. So I very quickly um, felt it was possible and, and, and wasn't concerned at all that it was just a small canvas, small um, concept film. It was really a one man show through and through. It actually is. And, and I felt that um, watching it, I felt that it's so compelling and he is such a compelling and magnetic presence. And maybe it's the, the feeling that you sometimes encounter truth um, and you feel that, that there, this is painfully true. And what he's all saying is coming from a very painful place. And you don't often get interviews with people who are that honest. Um, well, that, yeah, his, his honesty was something that made me feel that this is okay. Because again, the nature of the crime is so horrific. And you can't help but think, what if this man killed my father or some family member? How would I feel? And it's uncomfortable. And um, <laughs> To say the least. And and you so, talked yeah. about that. You talked about we we. I heard you say that you were thinking about reaching out to the victim's family if they were still to be found. Yeah, no, that was a very clear and present thought throughout the the process. Was do we fill in that part of the story? And that was very complicated because um, I had first convinced Larry to to agree to doing that, and he thought it would be a good thing, but in talking to uh, the pastors that he's worked with at the halfway house, um, the folks that run the halfway house, his parole officer, getting many opinions from people who um, had a different perspective on it than just wanting to tell a story, their sense, and I ultimately agreed, was it, it's not right or fair, and that, that's debatable, uh, to, to reach out to them for this and open up old wounds. Um, narratively, story-wise, it was definitely a concern. It is a concern to this day, but I felt that that was um, the right decision. I didn't want to um, push it. And um, I, again, I felt Larry's remorse is, is clear and present and really left it to the viewer to determine um, how they feel about him in the end. And among the things that you want the viewer to walk away with, there are those, just to be fair, there are those who have criticized what they call the rehabilitation of criminal perspectives um, in, in biographies like this one, where uh, the victim's story, it's not told from the victim's perspective, it's told from the criminal's perspective. And it's hard to speak about Larry as a criminal, even though clearly he was. But, um, you have, you have goals. You have had goals in telling this story. Do you want to share those? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 tough to talk about because to me, I always feel like when I'm asked to talk about those kinds of things, it's like when someone asks my favorite musician to describe what he was thinking when he was writing a song. But everybody brings their yeah. own thing to that song, and that's what makes the magic. So. For me, there was so many, as I said before, questions that this raised, things that made me uncomfortable. And I thought that those things were worth putting out there in the form of this story to, at the very least, 
initiate conversation around these issues, um, the criminal justice system. Is there any um, hope for rehabilitating a criminal? Does he deserve the chance to walk free after taking a life? And there's you know, obviously countless examples of this in our criminal justice system. You know, who are we as a country? What are the things that matter? Um, all, all of these issues and more are, are what I, I believe and I hope this, this raises. And like I said, I, at the end of the day, I think it raises more questions than it answers. And that's, that's, that's a good, good thing. That's what good art does. Yeah. And uh, people always talk about what's the role of the artist in our society. And you would say? I mean, John Lennon said it. I'm sure many artists have said it. It's really to hold up a mirror to that society and see who we are and what we are, you know, all the good, the bad, and the ugly. And if we can't acknowledge that and figure out, you know, what we can do differently, um, it's the old history will repeat itself. And on just bringing it back to Larry, as I said, just the notion of thinking twice, maybe before you, you know, do something, if you get hot in an, in an argument and um, act out, that has consequences. Um, for Larry, it was 35 years in prison. And everyone, I think, can put themselves in that situation in one way, shape, or form or another. And that doesn't necessarily have to be a physical altercation and that leads to someone's death. But think twice before you act. I mean, there's, there's a lot of lessons that, that just come think. out of this. Right. Exactly. And I'm assuming that Larry has seen the film? He has. It was, uh, again, uh, speaks volumes to the courage that he has had throughout this process. Um, we showed it to him for the first time at the halfway house that's portrayed in the film. He's since moved to an, another um, situation, but uh, he watched it in front of the entire house wow. uh, of, of men who have had all kinds of various you know, difficult experiences that led them to that place. And uh, his pastors and, and the folks that run the house. And that's incredibly courageous because you can imagine that group and how they would react to some of the very um, really raw and um, emotional things that Larry was, is discussing in the film. And at the end, you can see it. it, it changed them and they had a, a new a newfound respect for him even though at first it was almost like watching it and people were squirming and laughing because it was it was uncomfortable but um again tremendous credit to, to larry for the courage in, in even just doing that that's extraordinary yeah um do you have anyone you want to thank as long as we're giving you a platform here to your family or people who who have stood by you during this process it must have been sure you must have brought a lot of this home i mean all of this emotion in the yeah, process I guess, you know you try to <laughs> like any any job you try to separate your work from from your personal life but um yeah larry definitely touched me and and sure my family as a filmmaker if you don't have the support of your family um you're beat from from day one so tremendous Thanks to my family for supporting uh, me throughout all this, these filmmaking processes, which are always challenging. Um, you know, folks like you guys who, pro who provide the outlet, um, and, and it's great as a filmmaker to establish a relationship with um, a festival like yours, certainly the filmmakers I've worked with um, that gave of their time and money and uh, creativity to, to help, uh, bring this to fruition, which for me is really the, the real joy of filmmaking is the collaborative nature of, of the medium. And this was no exception. And <clears throat> you talked about the skills that you have acquired, that the trajectory of your career, your careers, you're multi, a multi-talented fellow. <laughs> do, you want to, do you want to talk about some of the, for a young filmmaker just starting out, somebody who's thinking sure. he was going to be a teacher or or a Wall Street broker, or a, or a scientist, or something. All of a sudden, he gets the bug. Sure. What does he have to know? Well, uh, this time in history, there's never been more opportunity to pursue that because of all of the um, technology that's available. Um, for me, 
as an independent filmmaker, you are forced to have to wear many hats. And a lot of times, as we talked earlier, the limitations um, lead to uh, new opportunities. So, you know, I started out as a writer director, but over the course of the 15 years that I've been doing this, there are situations where budgets don't allow for an editor or budgets don't allow for a cinematographer um, or a producer and you're forced to wear those hats. And that's a good thing because um, you then you can make the choice. Can I sit down and, and uh, learn a new software program so that I'm able to edit when I want to and need to, as opposed to when I can afford it or have, you know, the benefit of an editor who will commit to it. So um, it's those moments of difficulty that you have to assess what you can and need uh, to do to, to carry on to, to, in this case, deliver your story or your film. And for young filmmakers, all you need is your iPhone and, and a computer. And I think you could probably even edit on an iPhone. Um, it's not so. like it used to be where you need, you know, reams of film and expensive cameras and a team to, um, to back you up. So now is, is a fantastic time if you want to try it out and there's no risk. Digital um, video doesn't cost like film used to cost um, an arm and a leg for, for a reel. Now it's all possible. So I'd say if you're passionate about it, you have no choice but to pursue it and nobody to blame other than yourself if, if you're not doing it. That's outstandingly encouraging words and you'll be happy to hear that the last time I heard somebody say those words <clears throat> was uh, at, when Baz Luhrmann came out to launch oh, wow. his, seriously, he said exactly the same thing you said and this was when Great Gatsby, um, he came out here to give us a screening and he said that in the future you will have filmmakers as young as nine years old who will be able to edit their own films on there. And he said exactly the same thing. So you are, you are obviously in the right company and you are, <laughs> <That's for sure. laughs> and we are just, you thanked us, but let me thank you. Uh, we are very proud to, uh, to premiere this film for you, with you, with Larry. And uh, only regret that we couldn't have done this in person in front of a live audience. But I do hope that everybody who is who has watched the film and who is watching you here, um, everyone who has questions um, beyond the questions that I, I've asked you, will get them to us and we'll pass them along to you and we will keep this conversation going. Thank you so much and we wish you great success, not just with this film, which deserves success as well, but with all your future endeavors. Thank you. We My look pleasure. We'll see you in person. <laughs> Likewise, and hopefully we can get Larry out for perhaps a a live screening uh, sometime in the near future as well. Thank you, Scott. Thank you so much. <laughs>